the Old Testament tonight, the book of Nehemiah. If you find the book of Psalms, then you can flip back a few pages so, and you'll get to the book of Nehemiah right before the book of Esther. Nehemiah chapter 6. <clears throat> now once you get there, I want to ask you a question. I, I, I always like to ask questions that get you pulled out so you can answer them. What are you most afraid of? I don't answer that out loud. How many of you do have something that you're afraid of? And all the men raise their hand and say, my wife. <laughs> Being afraid is not uncommon in our world. Matter of fact, uh, we have a lot of things that we get afraid of. Uh, one of my fears is acrophobia. You might know what acrophobia is. Afraid of heights. Anybody else afraid of heights? Now, Robert, he isn't. I mean, he can go up 32 flights, lean out a window, kind of balance himself and put a window in. He, he, he's got it down, okay? Uh, how many of you are claustrophobic? Raise your hand. I can, I, that's my second thing. Uh, years ago when I, and I have, and thank the Lord, and I hope I don't have to, uh, years ago when I had to have an uh, MRI and had to go inside of that thing, I, I, they had a hard time getting me in that thing. Uh, finally, I mean, I went in and I got out real quick. And then they said, look, get, we got to get this done. So, uh, so I got there and they had to put a handkerchief over me. And for 45 minutes, that thing went clang, 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 you know, and you, it drives you nuts. But uh, we have those fears. Uh, there's a lot of phobias uh, that they talk about. You get any medical dictionary and look it up, and you'll find a lot of, of uh, fears that people have. Uh, uh, there's another one, uh, acrophobia. Uh, anybody know what that is? Okay. What about the, the fear of wild animals? Anybody got a fear of animals? <laughs> How many of you are afraid of snakes? I don't care what kind of snake it is. If there's a snake up here, I'm going to make a back door back there. Amen. Snakes. I don't like snakes. I mean, these little things crawl around over here sometimes. And I just go, ah, you know. And if I see one, I grab me a, 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 a you know, garden hose real quick and I just chop it up. I mean, and here it is still wobbling around, you know. But we have all kinds of fears in our life. Here in Nehemiah chapter 6, the whole objective, the whole objective of the chapter is to show us these individuals who were going, going against Nehemiah, they did one thing, and that was they were trying to put fear into the life of Nehemiah. And so I want you to go there, Nehemiah chapter 6, and... Uh, Verse 1 through 19 gives us the whole picture that God wants to drive home to our hearts. And I've titled, entitled the message tonight, Getting the Right Perspective. Because when you get the proper perspective of things, you don't have fear. Fear is something you really don't have to have as far as being afraid of things. Now, I believe that we ought to have a proper, what we call, fear of God. And that is having a proper respect or reverence for God. But uh, God doesn't want us to, matter of fact, he says this, he's not giving us the spirit of what? Fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So uh, percep perception in regards to fear uh, can change the whole picture. And Nehemiah came to that conclusion in his life, and I want to share that with you this evening. Look there at verse 1. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Ger Ger uh, Gershom uh, sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some uh, one of the villages in the plain of Ono. And now, right off the bat, you know, something's wrong here. You don't go down there, oh no, I'm not coming. I'm not going down to oh no, because that's an automatic thing. Oh no, I'm not going to do it. See? No. It's too bad that many of us and uh, our young people today have not learned the principle of saying no. Now, listen very carefully. When you and I are given a principle in God's word that says you shouldn't do it, 
what should we say? No. That's exactly what Nehemiah did in his life. He got the per proper perspective in regards to saying, matter of fact, our key verse is verse 12. Let's just jump down there real quickly. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He wanted to deter uh, Nehemiah, and so he kept asking, if you follow in the, uh, the, uh, in the verses on down through there, uh, you'll see that real quickly. Look at it. And I sent messages unto them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and, some, uh, and come down to you? Yet, here's what they did. And I want to tell you something, folks. Are you listening tonight? Something that God does not want you to do is going to keep on coming back to your life. It's going to keep coming back. You'll never get away from it. And what is the answer each time that thing you're confronted with, what should you answer it? No. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get involved. Why? Because biblical principles teaches me I should not get involved. God had already told him what to do. And if God tells you to do something, folks, we should not avoid that. Because we have a proper respect and a proper reverence from God. Can I hear an amen? amen. That will keep you from doing things that you know you shouldn't do or get involved in. Let me say something to you tonight. Did the Apostle Paul have a thorn in the flesh? Yes or no? Every one of us have a thorn in the flesh. And whatever that thorn is, we've got to com continue to say, I'm not going to let it deter me from being obedient to what God's Word says. Now, look back, if you would, at the Scripture there in verse number 5. Then sent Samuel his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. When it was written, as reported among the heathen, and Gashemu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. Now, whenever you and I are going to be doing and obeying God's word, you can, you can mark it down. The devil is going to bring a lie to you. You've got to have that. You need to do that. Uh, you need to keep on good terms with people, so you need to kind of bend a little bit. It, it won't hurt you uh, to bend your convictions. Well, yes, it will. All it takes is one time to bend that conviction. You have, listen, folks, lying is always lying. Come on. Amen. Stealing is always stealing, and it's called S-I-N. And we could go and, I mean, we could name all kinds of lists here tonight. If God's Word says we shouldn't do it, we shouldn't do it. We should say no. Now, it goes on to say there in verse 7, And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I send to him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. The devil, listen, the devil will always come to you with a lie to try to get you to do what God says you shouldn't do. That was true at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And I know we, we, we go back to that ever so often. And we say, uh, uh, why did Adam and Eve do what they did to bring sin upon the whole human, uh, human race? Because they did not respect God's word in saying no to that which God says you shouldn't do. They were sucked into it by the same principle that you and I, when we do not get a proper perspective of biblical principles and truths. You see, if you stick to the book, you never have a problem. God's Word is always true. And the Bible says this, God is not mocked. Say it with me. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall reap 
of the Spirit, everlasting life. God's Word does not change. It stays the same, and you and I, when we're obedient to it, we're better off in our lives. Now, let's go on. Uh, look at verse 9. For they all made us afraid, saying their hands shall be weakened. Now, that first part is very important for you to get into your mind. For they all made us afraid, saying their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Thou therefore, O God, strengthen mine hands. Now, here is the principle here. When the devil comes and tells you lies or send people to tell you lies or to get you to do something wrong, what are we to do? It's right there in the verse. He prayed, now therefore, O God, strengthen mine hands. In other words, Lord, give me the strength. Just go ahead and say no and not do it. See? We need God's strength. We cannot do it. Why? Now listen very carefully. You and I succumb to those things that are wrong that are contrary to what God has said simply because you and I still have the old sinful Adamic nature. Can you hear an amen? amen? If we constantly keep that in mind that we're fighting not uh, you know in a simple matter, we're fighting in a spiritual realm and our flesh is weak we're not, we don't, we're not capable of, def uh, of defeating the devil in our own strength. Listen, that's why Christians get caught up in immorality. That's why Christians get caught up in stealing at their jobs. That's why Christians get caught up in all kinds of wrong things is because of the fact they think they can overcome it themselves. And we can't do it. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, folks. We're no match. Listen, if the devil had the audacity to take and tempt our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God in the flesh, listen, he has no problem tempting you and me. He has no problem coming to you and me and saying, it's all right. Go ahead. I mean, one time won't hurt. All it takes is one time. That can ruin your life. Can destroy your reputation. Can take the joy of the Lord and disperse it. There are Christians out here in New London tonight that used to come to this church. That have not stepped back in the church. You say, why? Because they succumbed and listened to the devil. It's all right if I miss one time. Or if I do this or that. Now, don't misunderstand me. I realize there are times you cannot come to church. Why? Because you may be sick. Or you may be working. And, and, and that's, uh, we've got people who are working even tonight. They, that's part of their life. God understands that. All right? But when we get, begin to get sucked in to thinking oh, it's okay to, to stay away because here's the problem. God may have a message that will literally change you to be a success or if you stay away to be a failure. You and I need, I, that's why the Apostle Paul says that we're to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with long, long suffering and doctrine. All of us need our spiritual food. We all need physical food. Is that right? Now, the right physical food. We can eat the wrong physical food. And therefore, we can hurt our bodies uh, and, and the lacking of nutrients and so forth and so on that are necessary for the building up of our cell structures and all the, all the rest in our body. And I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going into that. But we need to build our lives up. Here's what God said. He says, building yourselves up on the most holy faith. You say, what is the most holy faith? The Bible. God made that statement through the Apostle Paul for a reason. So, what happens? Well, let's look at verse 10. Afterward, I came into the house of Shimei and the son of Deliah, the son of uh, Mehetilabel, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Now, stop right there. Are you listening? Please hear what I'm saying. Do you know the devil can even get you at church?
The devil can confuse you if you're not letting the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Now look here. He said, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Wrong objective of going to God's house. Don't come to God's house just because you think it's a good place. You come to God's house, God's house, for a reason. What is it? To worship the Lord in the spirit of His holiness. And I'm afraid a lot of times people go to church for the wrong reasons. Now, we also know it's a time that God does feed us with the Word. He wants us to hear the Word of God. He wants us to grow in grace and knowledge of Him. But, it's important for you to come to church for the right reason. Can I confess to you something tonight? I didn't want to be here this morning. You know why? I wasn't feeling good. I was tired. I was having stomach problems. And I tried to convince my wife, honey, just let me, and I'm, I'm kidding about this. I want to stay home. She said, honey, you're the preacher. You got to go. And she has said that to me before. Sometimes, sometimes our physical bodies don't want to do certain things. So how do you deal with that? You go to the Lord and say, Lord, now give me the right motive in why I'm going to church. Why I'm there. It changes the whole picture. You see, I believe this. When we come to God's house, we ought to prepare ourselves. Can I hear an amen? amen? That's why it's important. It's not how long it's that you do it. That you prepare your heart. That God can use you in some way to maybe say a word of encouragement to somebody or say something that might change the whole attitude of a person that you might run into. I mean, a smile even when you come to church might change the whole attitude of somebody who's come. So it's important in our lives. Now, look back, if you would, at verse number 11. And I said, Should such a man as I flee, and who is there, that being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life, I will not go in. Here's the key. And lo, I perceive that God has not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambal had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid, and do so in sin. Did you get that? There are people that are out to get you to sin. Even in God's house. We have opposition. People God might use to have you to sin. And I'm not going to the depths of that. That's not my objective tonight. And that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambal according to these their works. Now he comes back to the matter of prayer. Folks, I want to tell you something. Prayer can make all the difference in your life and my life at any given time. And I believe one of the biggest times is in church. It's called the imitation hour. There are people, their lives are hanging in the balance. During the invitation. And I've told you this on several occasions up the last few years. That the night that I got saved. My hands, if you probably could find those pews. They probably made quite an impression. On those pews. That night that I was standing there. Because there were eight others that went forward during the invitation. And I didn't go. But I know some people must have been praying for me because after the service, I made a beeline to the pastor and I said, I need to be saved. And that's when I got saved, February 17th, 1963. You see, the devil wants to keep us from praying. And one of the best things you can do during the invitation hour, yes, I know Doc has a thing. 
But one of the best things you can do is to pray that God would take and speak to those hearts and encourage them to make that decision that they could make. This morning there were three people that raised their hands about salvation. Now I'm not asking you to look up. I can look and see. God, I asked you, matter of fact, to have your heads bowed. But you can be praying that God would bring them to that place of true repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Or maybe somebody that has a decision they need to make to come back to the Lord, whatever it might be. But we need to pray. Now, jump down real quickly, and I'll give you a few thoughts here for the, for the message tonight. Look at verse 15. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elu, in the 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. So what can you and I do tonight in regards to our lives that God's work gets done in our individual lives as well as our whole ministry? Well, let me give you some things right after I pray. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, prayer with me please? Father in heaven, I ask you to take your word tonight, drive some things home here from this lesson of, uh, in the life of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6, that we look at these that uh, oppose, those that would get us turned to the side, those would get us, uh, uh, Lord, to sin against you and be disobedient. And I pray tonight our hearts will be warmed and challenged that this week, Lord, that we'd be a great testimony to do the work that you've given us here at First Baptist Church because there's a lot of folks out here need to be saved. There's a lot of folks out here need to get right with you and, Lord, return to the God of their salvation. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to reach this area of New London, Ohio, for the glory of God, that we would see the work be accomplished. And this ministry will be a glorification under your name. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if you would, at verse number one. We all need God's perception of the work that still needs to be finished. Look at it. Now, it came to pass when Sam Bout and Tobiah and Gershom, uh, Gishom and Ara uh, the Arabian, the rest of our enemies, heard that I had built the wall and that were so uh, no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. What's that speak to you of? That speaks of the fast there's still a work to be done. Folks, we still have a work to be done here at First Baptist Church in New London, Ohio. Amen. And God is calling all of us to do something. Now, not everybody can do everything, but you can do something. And God wants us to do that. Uh, take uh, your Bible and turn over to Matthew 14, 14 with me, if you would, please. Keep your place there in the book of Nehemiah. And turn over to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew 14, 14. The work that you and I still need to do and get finished must be geared by one simple principle that was in the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is that, preacher? Well, look there at Matthew 14, and look down at verse number 14. And I want you to read it with me, if you would. Are you there? Matthew 14, 14. Here we go. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with what? Compassion. What is compassion? Compassion and charity flow together because they're both action verbs. They mean that you and I must take and do something about that which is needed, and Jesus did in every case that he was confronted with. He had compassion, the Bible says. It's love in action. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. Is your love for people really in action? That means you're going to do something about it. And it says, he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. When he looked upon Jerusalem, he says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how, uh, uh, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I gather you together like uh, a mother hen does its chicks? Why do you say that? Because his love for the people of Israel. Though they offended him, though they lacked in their lives, he still loved them. And he still loves you and me. 
And folks, I want to say this to you tonight. He still loves the lost. And he wants them to be saved. And you and I have that wonderful opportunity to join hands with the Lord in a yoke even. And to reach out and win the lost. And I know I say this often, but the fact of the matter is, you and I, we have to constantly need to be probed in the fact of what we need to get done. And so, Jesus was our example in love. Jesus also was our example in doing the will of God. Take your Bible, you're in the book of Matthew, turn over to chapter 9 of the book of John. John chapter 9 and verse number 4, if you would. In John 9, 4, it says, I, say the next word with me, must. If you and I are going to see people reach, if we're going to, uh, and to me, uh, let me say this. It is important, but it's not the utmost important thing, and that is for an auditorium to be filled. I, I just like to have, see an auditorium filled, amen? If you have seats, why not fill them, huh? I mean, we like to see them filled. Jesus says here, I must, it's mandatory, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while his day, the night cometh, when no man can work. You see, Jesus, he was controlled by doing the will of God. He said, I must do it. It's something that's necessary. And it's necessary for us to reach out and care for the dying. Because God is merciful, and he wants every person to be saved. But there's something else. Look back at chapter 4 of John. And uh, look down at verse number 34, if you would. I believe this was in view in Nehemiah's mind as well. Here in verse 34, read it with me, in chapter 4 of John. Let's read it together. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to do what? Finish his work. Folks, the gates have not been put up yet. The gates still need to be put up. God says we still have work. And Nehemiah says we've got a work to do, and we need to finish it. And so in verse 15 of, turn back to the book of Nehemiah, in verse 15 of chapter 6 of Nehemiah, so the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month, Elu, in the 50 and 2 days. You see, that was important. Now you say, why was it important? Well, look down at verse number 16. You and I are being looked upon by this community. They want to see if we're real. And in verse 16 it says, And it came to pass that when all the, our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of whom? Of our God. We have a reputation to hold up. And that is, we believe in people going to heaven. We believe in people getting saved. We believe in helping people. And I'll ask you a question, when's the last time you helped somebody? You see, God's looking for a few good men. And women. So I'm not going to exclude you. We need God's perception of the work that still needs to be finished here at First Baptist Church. And we can't give up. Uh, the devil would come to us and say, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't do it. But we can do it. When we have, are you listening? A mind to work. A mind to work. God wants us to put on our gloves. He wants us to put on our work clothes. And we got a work to do. But there's a second thing very quickly tonight. Look there in verses 2 through 7. When we need God's perception concerning, concerning things and those who would deter us. If you're not aware of those who are trying to get you sidetracked, then you're going to be pulled away from the things that you used to do for the Lord. 
You see, God still wants to use you. God still uses mankind to accomplish his work today. And we're joining hands with God to get the job done. Now, what's going to happen is this. There's going to be those who are going to come along and they're going to bring false accusations and they're going to do everything they possibly can to get you sidetracked. That happened here in verse number 2. That same ballot and Gisham sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the, the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me what? Mischief. The devil wants to do that in your life and get you sidetracked from the most important thing that he gave the disciples when he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, this is our world. This is our life. You have friends, you have neighbors, you have loved ones, you have those you work with and so forth and so on that need to hear the gospel of Christ. Sometimes you may not get to present the gospel right away, but possibly you can give them a gospel track or you can invite them to church. God has a message for us. And sometimes... You might be able to get them. I remember years ago, matter of fact, my wife was uh, talking about this the other day, uh, Charlie Maddox and his wife. Uh, Charlie, I'll never forget Charlie as long as I live. My wife uh, and her mother was going to my hometown church. I was, I'd been going to, I was still in college. And uh, they had a little contest. Contests are not wrong. We're not bribing people. We're, you know, uh, pack your pew. And that's exactly what she was to do. Pack your pew. Have you heard that before? Pack your pew. Well, she packed her pew. And guess what happened? Charlie Maddox got saved. And I believe his wife did too. But Charlie got saved. I want to tell you something. Charlie was a changed man. And Charlie showed it. And he witnessed other people. God... The cause of that outreach reached a man that might possibly would have never gotten saved if there wasn't something like that. I want to challenge you. Pack a pew. Challenge somebody. Invite somebody. Hey, like Brother Ed. I, I've always liked this about Brother Ed. Now, there's a lot of things I like about Brother Ed, believe it or not. But I remember this, Brother Ed, when I first came here. About you taking somebody out to lunch, inviting them. Hey, you come to church with me, I'll take you out to lunch. He's a briber. Yeah, that's... But, uh, Brother Ed, would you invite me to church? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes that's what it takes to get that person in the church, maybe take them out, and then they get saved. Or they at least get the opportunity of hearing the gospel. Why? Because we have a great work that still needs to be finished. But the devil's going to do everything he possibly can to keep you from taking and inviting people so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we need God's perception concerning those things that might turn us away and, and, and not uh, reach out to people. You know, I'm too busy. Or, you know, they wouldn't let, my next door neighbors wouldn't listen to me anyway. And I've told you about uh, our neighbors when we were there in southern Ohio when I was a pastor at Calvary Baptist Temple. And uh, how our next door neighbors got saved. You see, we may think that person next to us or right down the road wouldn't come to church, but all it takes is your invitation. Stop by. Give them a gospel track. Say, I, I don't know if you go to church anywhere, but I just want you to know I'd like to invite you to our church. That's what it takes. And the devil will say, uh, you don't want to go there. That, that, that person, listen, I'm not going to mention a name, but years ago when I was at the Open Bible Baptist Church in Williamstown, New Jersey, I hadn't been there a long time as associate pastor, but uh, we had this road right behind the church called Green Road. Good name, huh? Green Road. Anyway, uh, I'm trying to think of, Doug was the husband's name and Fern was the wife. And Doug was a rough guy. And so was Fern. I went and visited them. Both of them got saved. One day, Fern called me up and said, um, uh, Pastor, would you go with Doug to see my father? 
He's in the hospital. But before you go, let me tell you a little bit about my dad. He'll probably curse you out when you go there. He's a rough man. By the way, he's already told and thrown things at the nurses already at the hospital. So I'm not telling you there won't be something that'll happen. Well, you know what I want to do? I'm not going. I said, tell Doug to come and we'll go. We went and I, I honestly, I thought the guy was going. He, he, he was an old sailor boy. That, and remember what I told you, and I'm telling you the honest truth, the nurses would come in and he would throw things at them. And he'd curse them out. Her dad got saved. And all those nurses that were taking care of him says, there's something different about this man. He's changed. Folks, I want to tell you, the power of the gospel changes a person's life. Amen? Amen. And if you and I will let the Lord take and guide us, and not listen to the devil, but do what God tells us to do, we'll get the job done. We need to keep a proper perspective of the fear of the Lord in our lives and not fear mankind. You see, God says, I'll take care of the situation if you'll listen to me. And I've got a lot more to say about that, but we need to keep that proper perspective. We need to keep a proper perspective of prayer. And I told you this a while ago there in verse number 9, where he says, Now therefore, O God, strengthen mine hands. It's never easy to go knock on a door. It's never easy to take and to talk to maybe somebody about the Lord, but God can strengthen your hands. He can help you along that line. But look down at verse number 15. Let me close with this tonight. We need to have God's perception of the finished work. What's God's perception? So the wall was finished. Now here's the thought. Whatever God tells us to do, we can get it done. We can get it done. We can do the job. We can finish the work. Because God said we could do it. And if God says we can do it, we can do it. And we all need to get the perception of what will happen in verse number 16. Every person here, regardless of who you are, you have an influence on other people. God will use your influence if you let it be guided by the Lord. And that's what happened here in verse number 16. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof. I mean the word, listen. The word will get around. I, listen, if a church gets on fire, people will come just to check out and see what's going on. And that's what happened. And the Bible says... And all the heathen that were about us saw these things. They were much cast down in their own eyes. Why? Because God had done the work. For they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Folks, that's what I want here at First Baptist Church in my life. The God, God is wrought the work here. And folks, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the key that we must keep before us is, the work is not finished yet. We have a great work to do. Amen? The souls will be reached out here. Some people say, well, all the doors have been knocked on. Well, we'll go back and knock on them again. Maybe some new people have moved in. And that's true. But they may also, because of the influence of our lives, have a willingness to listen, whereas they would not listen before. If we go with God strengthening our hands. So the question is tonight, what are you going to do about God's unfinished work? Are you going to help get the gates put up? Are you going to do your part that God is speaking to your heart about? It, it may be this tonight, very quickly. It may be that God is speaking to your heart about being a Sunday school teacher. About joining, uh, do, you, do you think you can need some help, uh, Brother Sandy? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe going out and visiting on the van, maybe once a month with Brother Sandy. Maybe some other areas. Just riding with me, going to go get the kids. Yeah, just riding with him on Sunday morning to go get the kids. Maybe God tonight, and I might as well throw this in, I, I can't 
hurt anything. Maybe God is speaking to you about being the coordinator for our vacation Bible school. How many of you believe a child's soul is worth having vacation Bible school? Would you say amen? Raise your hand. God wants us to reach. By the way, we had some new kids here this morning. Amen. Are their souls important? Yes. You never know that new kid that we might reach during vacation Bible school that might become another Dion Moody or are some great lady for the Lord. A Fanny Crosby, for example. When we look to see that the work is not finished, God can strengthen our hands and we can get the job done. And what God's asking you tonight, don't listen to the same ballots and the Gisham, but listen to me and we'll get the work done. We'll get the gates put up. For the glory of the Lord. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. With your head bowed and eyes closed, I want to read you something. And I want you to think on it very quickly. It was given by Israel's Defense Forces Major Elliot Chodoff. And here's what he says. Truth is your weapon and facts are your ammunition. Load up. <coughs> truth is your weapon. Folks, we have the word of God, the truth. Thy word is truth. We have the facts that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he wants the whole world to know about it. That's our ammunition. Now we're to load up and go out here into New London and the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. And God's asking you to be a volunteer. Will you do it? Let's stand and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray you would take your word tonight and speak to each one of our hearts that we'd see the job, the work that's before us is not complete. And it will not be complete till you come. So that means we still keep moving ahead. We keep doing what we ought to do. And that is doing the work of the Lord that he's assigned us to do. May we not fail you, but we ask you to strengthen our hands that we can get the job done. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Doc, what are we saying?